As we um, proceed t- today, is uh, our special series begins on um, the, the Negro National Anthem, the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. And for this entire month, we're going to see the biblical relevancy to Lift Every Voice and Sing, right? And each Sunday, I'm going to unpack a different verse. There's three verses, so we're going to spend some time on two because uh, one of the verses is just take some time to really unpack it and see uh, how it is in alignment with scripture all right but what we're going to do every day it, it, you do know that it was written by James the words it was a collaborative effort by two brothers James Weldon Johnson and his brother John Rosamont Johnson so they were the original Johnson brothers. Are the brothers Johnson? I'll be good to you, brothers Johnson. Before I'll be good to you, good to you. All right, lift every voice and sing, all right? Now you can remember their names. James, Weldon, John, Rosamond. How do you remember their names? Because there are two disciples Jesus had whose names were what? James and John. So what, who do you think they were named after? James and John. The sons of Zebedee, the sons of Johnson. James and John. James Weldon, you know that. You remember uh, John Rosamont. I remember it because you always remember things, young people, by association. I remember Rosamont because of Rosa Parks. So James Weldon Johnson, John Rosamont Johnson the brothers Johnson, all right? Let's sing verse one. It's a formal song. A formal song is a song that you stand when you sing. You you, you act your best, all right? And we're gonna sing every, lift every voice and sing, all right? Amen. God bless you. Now, here is your homework for the entire month. Here is your homework. Download the words. On the fourth Sunday, 
we will not put the words on the screen because they will be in your head. Now y'all say, I ain't coming this Sunday. Room. All right. And just as loud as you were, we want, now if you, you can learn the Star Spangled Banner and it was written by a slave owner. Francis Scott Key owned slaves. And in verse 3 of the Star Spangled Banner, it's a, verse 3 celebrates slavery. So you can learn, lift every voice and sing, right? All right, so we're going to do that. Don't forget, all right, we're going to send out some messages. Sherry, remind me, we're going to send out some messages to constantly remind the members. If we don't have your, your emails and stuff, please let us have your information because we need to send you scriptures and verses and other things. That's how we communicate in the 21st century. We ain't going to send no bill money. ain't going to ask for your time money. Just, just, all right. Okay. Verse 1 of Lift Every Voice and Sing is a song about the present, where we are now. Verse 2 is about the past. Verse 3 is about the future. It's a song about where Christians should start when they begin reading the Bible. The starting point for our church as a black congregation. And then you'll have people say there's no such thing as a black congregation. Yes, there is. When I say black, I'm talking about black in three ways. Black the three C's, black, color. I'm looking at black folk. And white brothers and sisters who are in this room who are not black in pigmentation, but black in identification. So Ken Jobes is white in pigmentation, but he's got an afro. He is my brother. I take Ken Jopes any day before I take Clarence Thomas. <laughs> that was the problem with the tree. The tree thought just because the axe had wood attached to the head, the iron, that meant that the Acts love trees. But that wood, although it came from a tree, was working with the enemy to cut down that which it came from. Just like them cops in Memphis. They from a tree, but they act they they they, they connected with an axe. Here. So, my brothers and sisters, uh, we are a black church because of color, but there's two other C words. Culture. There is a distinct culture that is nurtured in the black church. So, when you hear Carol Kirby sing, that's us. You know, we don't, we, we, we add stuff in songs <laughs> that was never intended to be in the song. That's why we stay in church so long, because we, we add so much to it. <laughs> At the other churches, it's okay, I'm not um, by any means um, speaking negatively of this, it's just, it's just we're different, and that's not, and that's okay to be different. If they sing Amazing Grace, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. That's how they sing it over there. Over here we sing, oh, oh, oh. Amazing. (laughs) 
that's culture. Culture. What's in the word culture? What jumps out at you when I say culture? I am not going to finish this. And it's too important to rush through. So if I got to go over into March, I ain't going to finish this. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you for permission. You just gave it to me. What's in the word culture? Cult. A cult is, some, is, is a closed community. You're right. The cultist, the closed community. But here's another word. It's a verb. Culture. Cultivate. So you've been cultivated differently in your culture. Your culture is what cultivates you. There is a difference between American Bandstand and Soul Train. There's a difference between Dick Clark and Don Cornelius. So when I say black church, I'm talking about color. I'm talking about culture. And here's the most important thing. The most important thing. Get it. Third C word. First C word. Second C word. Third C word. Control. The deacons and trustees and staff who control this look like you. Now, you don't realize how important it is until you stop to think you don't control nothing. But this is an institution with all this property, with all these buildings, with all this acreage. It's one of the few things in society that black people can say, I control this, institutionally speaking, all right? The problem, however, for us has been is that we have been preached to and read Sunday school materials that was written by other people and it did not have you in mind, just like the public school system has a curriculum that indoctrinates our kids to act in the best interest of their oppressors. And we don't even realize it. How would Muhammad Ali be if he fought three minutes around and then in the the minute where he, the bell rings where he can get some rest, he goes to Joe Frazier's corner. And Eddie Fletcher's is in Joe Frazier's corner, and he goes to Joe Frazier's corner, and Joe Frazier's manager is telling Ali what he's supposed to do to win. What's Joe Frazier's corner going to tell him? Keep your, keep your gloves down. Stand next to the rope. Stick your chin out. He's going to give him the wrong information because Joe Frazier's corner was not created for Ali. He needs his own corner. And the reason we messed up when our kids are messed up is because we're sending our kids to corners that was never meant for them. And when I create a corner, or we create corners in our space that was meant for us, we so used to being in the wrong corner that if somebody says, now come to the right corner, we think we're crazy. That's because we've been hitting the head so many times. And the whole story of the song, Lift Every Voice and Sing, is a story about where the black church begins its study of the Bible. I've got Jamar Tisby here who is a, look him up on the internet, y'all. This man is respected all over the world. His books, the bestseller, they, the, the, the white, uh, what's it, Episcopalians, they live by this guy. And he will tell you 
that the starting point for Bible study, which is because you start the wrong place, you're going to end up in the wrong place. That the starting point for Bible study is Matthew 28, 19, and 20 in the white church, white conservative evangelical church. Matthew 28, 19, 20, which talks about evangelism, which is really nothing but the obfuscation of Eurocentric imperialism. what it is, imperialism, the imposition of a culture to make one culture universal. That's why, universal, that's why you can't think in your mind of a black Jesus. Because the white Jesus has been imported to the Asians, to the Native Americans, to the black folk. It's, it's universal. It's only when you begin to see God in your image since you've been made in, in the image of God that you become healthy. And they will tell you the starting point is Matthew, but the starting point for us is the Exodus. And slavery. And that God is on the side of the oppressed. That God is on the side of the marginalized and the underdog. And that's what the song is about. Let us march on till victory. Marching to victory, what we've gone through, where we are, what we must commit to to get to victory. Exodus chapter 2, let me give you some scripture. Verse 10 says, later when the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses. For she explained, I lifted him, stop here, out of the water. So even the most important word in the Negro National Anthem is in verse 10. The most important word in the Negro National Anthem is lift. And in verse 10, there is the word, I lift. And guess what Moses' name means? I lift. He's going to be what? Lifted from the water. And once he gets lifted from the water, he's going to turn back and lift his brothers and sisters out of slavery. And the whole point of lift every voice and sing is that people who have been lifted must then turn around and do what? Lift somebody else. And he got lifted. And you know the story, right? Go to chapter 1. Chapter 1, uh, this is the background story. It says, in time, Joseph and all his brothers died, ending that entire generation. Watch the text. But their descendants, the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful. Stop here. And what? Feel the land. So who are the Hebrews, these Israelites? They are in Egypt as what? Immigrants. How did they, why and how did they immigrate uh, to Egypt? Because in the book of Genesis, there was a famine. Under who? Joseph. And Joseph, who was second in command under Pharaoh, brought his family to Egypt to help them survive the famine. We did a whole series on Joseph. And now time has passed, and what has happened to Joseph's descendants? They grew, they multiplied, and they developed and became prosperous in Egypt. And there arose a Pharaoh in Egypt who began to count the numbers. What's the Pharaoh's name?
Donald Trump, come on, man. <laughs> there was a pharaoh who counted the numbers, like Trump counted the numbers and said, I got to build a wall. Eventually, a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph about what he had done. He said to his people, the Egyptians, look, the people, the Hebrews of Israel, now outnumber us. We would call it, if I could bring it into the today, the browning of America. Our men will be studying Roland Martin's book called Fear. And they're studying the book called Fear by Roland Martin because there is a, the, 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 the browning of America. That's why you see all of this CRT, critical race theory issues, and can't teach black history, and we got to get control of this thing. That is out of fear of being displaced because of the browning of America and probably even sooner than was expected that by, night, by 2030 that the United States will be a minority, majority nation. And, and that's why you have January 6th. And that's why you have Charlottesville because it's about power. And who's in control? And, and it says nothing new. He said to his people, look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. We must make a plan. It's called policies. Public policy. We got to have a public policy to keep them from growing even more. That's called power, y'all. Power is the ability to cause something to happen. When you got power, you can cause something to happen. But power is also the ability to prevent something from happening. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then we will what? They will escape from the countries. Uh, so the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. Slaves. And they were slaves for 400 years. It's like we were slaves, for, for, made them slaves. The reason why we, can, we, we are not as developed as we are as a people, our, our history, our experience, is because we spent 246 years as slaves. The word school, online, the word school, the word scholar, comes from the word in Greek, listen to me, schola, schola. You know what schola means, school means, scholar means, it literally means leisure or vacation. The reason why is because to be a scholar or to go to school, what must you have? Time. So if you work three or four jobs, the reason you can't develop yourself is not because you don't have what it takes to develop. You, other folk are not smarter than you. They got more time and they got more treasures. And because they have more treasures, they don't have to work two or three jobs. Or their mama or their daddy pays their tuition. Y'all ain't helping me. Their mama and their daddy pays their tuition. And can I help you? They ain't more, they're not smarter than you because they got time and treasure, the two T words. They also have a mom and daddy that can give them tutors. And help them write papers. It makes a difference when you got some money in your pocket. Preach up in here, Kevin Winkons. So it says, make them slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them out crush, with crushing labor, forced them to build the cities of Washington, Atlanta, Louisville. 
Because the only reason why there is a United States was because it was built with free labor. But guess what? In spite of the slavery, they kept on growing. It's like Carol Kirby's song. They never lost their hope. So plan one didn't work, beat them down with slavery, so they had plan two. And plan two was to take every Hebrew boy. It's in verse 22, the last verse, I think it is. Since plan one didn't work, plan two is then Pharaoh gave this order to all the people, throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River. But you let the girls live. Take every boy, throw him in the river. Just like Emmett Till. In August of 1954, after they beat him and lynched him, and it was Negroes who took the Bryants to Emmett's house. Always us. Took him to the house, lynched him, and then put a 70-pound cotton gin around his neck with barbed wire and threw him into the Tallahassee River. One white judge said, why y'all upset about one black boy in the Negro boy in the Tallahassee River? There's a whole lot of Negroes in that river. So every newborn who? Boy! What happened to Breonna Taylor was tragic. But what's happening to black boys is a trend. Talk to me, somebody. Who's filling these detention halls? Who's filling these rivers? It's black boys. Mass incarceration inaugurated by the Democrats. Focused on black boys, the new Jack, Jack era, the, the, the crack era of the 90s, and, and, and get tough, and build bigger jails and supermax jails to people who've been oppressed. And that's what we're dealing with in our society today. Black boys, uh, uh, Tyree, Brother Tyree Nichols, beat down, George Floyd, beat down. And before the police beat them up, society had beat them down in the school system in communities where there are no access to opportunities, in communities that are, that are opportunity deserts, we take it for granted. But the greatest thing you have going for you is your social networks, by the way. Most jobs don't, you don't get a job because it, you, you applied online. Don't go for the okey-doke. You get a job because you know somebody. Y'all ain't helping me in here. And these kids who don't have connections trying to survive in a survival mode, especially our boys, and they trying to survive, do things that are self-sabotaging, end up in jail. We say, look at them. So if you take, listen to me, all the women, hear me, all the women in the world, every country, and, and said, from that number, how many women are in prison? Count all the women in the world. Just don't talk to the United States. In the world, who are in prison. And then just take the number of black boys and men who are in jail today. There are more black males in jail today in the United States than all the women in the world. 
They target the boys. You know why they target the boys? Because they were threatened because the population was growing. So if you're trying to stop a population from growing and not getting strong, who do you target? Who initiates procreation? Boys. So if you can cut that off, you can destroy the boys. And that is when you study the Moses, you just wonder, where, where's Moses' daddy? Amram, where's Amram? All you see in the opening story of Moses is women. Just women. Chapter 1, you read about the midwives. Then you read about Jacobed. Moses' mother. You read about Moses' big sister, Miriam. You read about Pharaoh's daughter. None but women. You don't see no men in this thing. And the reason you don't see any, any brothers, because the brothers are either, either in slavery, in jail, or dead. And that's what's wrong with our boys today, sisters. I don't need no man. Well, your son does. I had a father. That's why I am. He kicked my behind. I was scared of my daddy. And guess what? Not only do your boys need males, but your girls do. They need a father. They need a mother. They need a mother. They need a mama. You need a mama. But a wise mama knows she, that my child also needs a father. And even if you're not married to him, and even if he ain't worth nothing, find an uncle. Find a cousin. Find a deacon. Find somebody. So they, I, I got to get out of here. They, they, uh, they said, throw them into the, to the Nile. Oh, every boy, throw them into the Tallahassee. Make them all Emmett Till. But there was a mama who practiced civil disobedience. That's what Henry David Thoreau talks about on, on Walden's Pond. He said, uh, an unjust law is no law at all. So they practiced civil disobedience. And Jacobed... Moses and mama said, hey, well, look, Pharaoh, look, Trump, you may get all the other boys, but you won't get mine. And that ought to be the determination of every mama in this room. You might get every other boy, but you ain't going to get mine. And she hid him, and you got to hide your son. She hid him for three months until she couldn't hide him anymore. So she said, God, I'm going to make a basket out of the reeds. And she made a basket out of the reeds and she made it unsinkable and waterproof. Y'all ain't helping me. Then she put little, the big mole in the, in the basket. Then put him on the bosom of the Nile River. And put him under the watch care of a God that neither slumbers nor sleeps. And God looked down. And God said to the crocodiles, you can view, but you can't chew. <laughs> because I got a purpose for this baby. Watch God. And right about that time, she, Moses, uh, Pharaoh's daughter, had a need to go take a bath. She goes down to bathe. And there's a basket in the reed. She don't even notice the basket until God reaches down and pinches Moses. And when he pinches Moses, what does Moses do? He cries. And when he cries, Pharaoh's daughter hears Moses crying, says to her attendant, go get that basket. She gets the basket, opens it up, and it's a, it's a Hebrew boy. By the name of Lift. 
Ah, that's his name. His name that's ought to be your name. His name is Lymph. And the Bible says that she says that's one of the Hebrew boys, and her maternal instincts kicked in. Because, see, it's not by might, nor by power, but by your spirit, saith the Lord. Which is to say that, the, that when we try to get somewhere, we think we got to fight folk and cuss folk out and get on folks' level. But the spirit of God will make your haters bless you. There's some folk that don't like you but we'll turn around and do something for you because the spirit of God, because this is Pharaoh's daughter. He, she, she takes the baby and says, oh, I, I, I want to care for this baby. And Moses' sister was watching it and jumps out, thank God for big sis, and says, uh, I know a mother who's lactating. And can feed and nurse the baby. And Pharaoh's daughter says, go get her. And guess who she gets? Isn't God good? She said, take the baby. Don't realize it's whose baby it is. Take the baby. Nurse the baby for me. And I'll pay you. In other words, God is making the enemy because God can prepare a table before you and he'll make your enemies pay for it. Y'all ain't hearing me. Just like uh, that, that woman who was a churchgoer and she didn't have anything to eat in her apartment and she said, God, help me. Please, Lord, I got to eat. And the atheist who owned the apartment complex who lived right next door heard her praying for food. So when she left and went to church that Sunday morning, he went to Kroger's to play a joke on her and got some food and put it on the front of her apartment door and wrote a little note that read, uh, uh, heard your prayer, here's your food. And when she comes up the steps and sees the, the bag and pulls the note and reads it and looks in the bag. She starts hollering, thank you, Lord. And then that atheist jumps out of his room and says, fool, uh, I paid for that fool. I brought you that fool. She said, oh, no, God, God sent him, but he made the devil pay for it. <laughs> and sometimes God can make your enemies pay for it. So he, 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 he saved, lifted from the water. He goes to Pharaoh's house for 40 years where he's nurtured in Pharaoh's house. I mean, he's got all the best education according to the book of Acts. He's, he takes hieroglyphics 101. He's proficient in pyramid building 202. He knows how he learned. He takes a class on, on how to whoop Negroes 303. Y'all ain't helping me in here. Hallelujah. I mean, he, he, because he's next in line to be Pharaoh. If you could see his chariot. Yeah, come on. Y'all know what the license plate reads? Pharaoh 2. Because he's next in line. To be the next Pharaoh. But verse 11 says, uh, verse 11 says, many years later, 40 years later, when Moses was grown up, and that's the sign that you've grown up, is when you take an interest in your people, he went out to visit his own, his own, his own. He went out to visit. Pookie. To visit his own people, the Hebrews. And he saw how hard. That's, 
And that's what the song Lift Every Voice and Sing is about with James Warren Johnson and, 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 and John Rosamont Johnson who wrote it in 1900, written for some by 500 children. Jacksonville, Florida in 1900, they sung it on Lincoln's birthday in Black History Month that had not even been prevented, invented. He was Moses because he grew up with privilege. The, well, the Johnson brothers were educated. John graduated from an HBCU called Florida Memorial College, which is a Baptist school in Miami. And what he is saying, like Moses, I'm lifted. I'm doing well. I got a good education. I've, I've got uh, protection. I'm doing well. But it's not enough for me to do well. Lift every voice, not just my voice, but lift every voice. And the reason why Moses wanted to lift other voices is because Moses got lifted. And the only reason, can I be real, the only reason you're here, I know the only reason I'm here is because God lifted me. And some of y'all were stuck in some reeds, and some of y'all were smoking some weeds. But God lifted you. I don't know what God lifted you from, but you ain't always been where you are right now. There, there was some men who were testifying in church. One man said, you know what, I don't look at women like I used to. Another man said, uh, I don't run around like I used to. Another man said, I don't drink like I used to. And an old woman in the church said, well, the reason why he don't look at women like he used to is because he's blind. <laughs> and the reason why he don't run around like he used to is because he's in a wheelchair. And the reason why he don't drink like he used to is because uh, he's got cirrhosis of the liver. In other words, not because you were saved, you were just sick. Y'all ain't going to help me in here. In other words, the only reason why I'm here, and the only reason why you're here is because the Lord lifted you. Do I have a witness in here? The Lord has protected you. And if the Lord has lifted you, then you should lift. Don't look down on anyone except you're going to do what? Lift them up because the Lord lifted you. I'm closing. Back in one of the cultures of Africa, when, whenever they would have a young man transition into manhood, they made that 12-year-old boy stay out, out in the jungle by himself. And at night, he could, uh, he had to stay there all night in this one place. And, and he, he would be afraid because he would hear things in the night. He didn't know what it was, a lion, a coyote. He didn't know what it was. It could be a coyote. It could be uh, uh, any type of predatory animal. But he'd stay out there all night. But he couldn't leave. Because if he left, he wouldn't be called a man. So this one boy who was afraid and hearing things all night. Wanted to run because he heard things and he didn't know what it was. Your mind can play tricks on you in the dark. So he decided to go to sleep to take his mind off of it. And he went to sleep. But when he woke up in the morning and the sun rose, guess what he saw? The first thing he saw when he opened up his eyes, he couldn't believe it, was his daddy. And his daddy was standing up looking over him. And his daddy had a spear and his daddy had a bow and arrow. And that's when he realized that he thought he was alone that night. But he could not see it, but all night. When it got dark, he didn't know it, but all night. When it was dark, his father was there protected him. In other words, there were some things that maybe should have gotten to him, 
But it didn't get to him because his father was out there that at night protecting him. And many of you have been through some dark nights. In fact, some of y'all are going through a dark night right now. But can I tell you what makes me happy? Is that when I look over my life, whenever it got dark, I, the, the hand of God, the favor of God, the protection of God was there in the darkness protecting me and God was protecting Moses in the Nile and God was protecting you and because God lifted you then you have a responsibility to go back and help lift somebody else up do I have a witness in here and I believe there's somebody that can holler he lifted me he lifted me when other else could help. Love lifted me. Did he lift you? Did he lift you when you were down? Did he lift you when you were sick? Can I ask you a question? Has anybody here ever prayed to the Lord and say, Lord, I can't lift myself? And the Lord came down and reached down and lifted you. Holler with me. He lifted me. Look at your neighbor and say, he lifted me. They say, he brought me from a mighty long way. Somebody will be hollering right now. He's been, he's been good to me because he lifted me. Do I have a church in here? Tragedies are commonplace. All kinds of diseases. People are passing away. The economy is down. I can't get enough pay. As for me, all I can say is thank you, Lord, for all you've done for me. It could have been me outdoors with no food and no clothes. Just another number with a tragic end. But he would not let none of these things be. But every day, by your power... You keep on and keep on and keep on blessing me. And I just want to say thank you, Lord, for all you've done for me. Let the church holler, yeah. Yes, Lord. We are our heavenly father's children. And he loves us. What and all. Yet there are times we ask the question. Or ask the voice. Or call. If we are willing, he will teach us. His voice only. To obey no matter where. Because he knows. He knows. Just how much we can bear. And when you're at your point. Where you want to give up. He will. Won't he lift you? Somebody holler. Yeah. He will lift you. Let's stand all over this room. We'll pick up on this next week. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's bless the Lord in this place. God will lift you. Has God lifted anybody in here? That's enough to give him praise. Maybe you found yourself in a dark place. And you don't know that our Lord and Savior can lift you. He can give you the power. He will walk with you. And he will be with you. All you have to do is call 502-583-6798. Or you can email us at newstart at org. Or maybe you're here in the sanctuary. And you're in a dark place. And you don't know God can lift you. Come down and give your heart to God. And your hand to decision counselors. The doors of the church are open. 
Why don't you come, my brother, my sister, as our praise team leads us in song? tithes and offering, you can continue to give across all our platforms or you can give right outside the doors and offer to our receptacles. Let us not forget about the race to fitness out there in the Family Life Center. Amen. Go out there and sign up and let us not forget that Maddie's Kitchen is open. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts for the benediction. Oh, gracious God, we come before you, Lord God, just to say thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, for lifting us, Lord God, when we were down, Lord God. Lord God, we ask, Lord God, that you help us, Lord God, to lift others up, Lord God, when they're down. Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, just for just being God and God all by yourself, Lord God. Lord God, as we prepare to leave this place but never your presence, Lord God, guide us down the highways and byways. Keep us till we return to your house once more. And let the church say amen and amen.